Good job, Brother Asher. All right. So anyways, now we come to the, the most important part of the service, the preaching of the word. And um, it's my honor to be up here and to be your Bible teacher this morning. And I'm going to start uh, reading in Jeremiah 7. And I've got a, I'm only going to read the first two scriptures, so I'll have you stand uh, for the first two scriptures, and then I'll have you go ahead and take a seat. Jeremiah 7 and 1 says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. You may be seated. Now this is, this is what I want to do today. I want to stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim the word of the Lord. Church, let's, let's have a word of prayer before I get started. Lord God, I come to you this morning. Lord, I want to preach your word the way it needs to be preached, God. I want, I want these words to not come back void, Lord God. Lord, I pray that your message would lay a heavy on the hearts of your saints today, Lord God. We invite you into this service. We want to feel a move of God this morning, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so that passage continues on. Jeremiah's words that he's going to proclaim in the gates. Uh, he says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. That would be like us today saying, I go to church, I go to church. I'm a Republican, I'm a Republican. Trust ye not in the lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place and the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye still murder and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not? And come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do all these abominations. Now, you have to understand the period of time that Jeremiah was preaching. What I just read to you is what is often referred to as the sermon at the temple gate by the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah prophesied during the reign of five kings, Josiah being the first one. Now, he was a young boy when Josiah reigned, and we all know Josiah from my teaching a few weeks ago. What, at what age did he become king? Eight. Eight. He became king at the tender age of eight. Ten years later, he began a renovation project of the temple of God. I mean, how bad was it that the temple of God was in such dilapidation that they had to begin a renovation project of the temple? That's how sinful the nation of Judah had become. And while they did the renovation project, they found a copy of the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic scrolls. And these scrolls were read to King Josiah. And when he read these scrolls, God dealed with him to, to follow the law of the Lord, to follow the law of God. And he acted fairly and righteously. He cared for the poor and the widows. He tore down the high places. He eliminated much of the idol worship that was going on during that time. Folks, good leadership is so important. If we find a good leader who preaches the word of God, we've got to hold on to that man. Now, as we all know, King Josiah was killed by Egyptian archers in a battle with Pharaoh Necho of Egypt. Next came Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz. Now, he only ruled for three months. He was removed by Pharaoh Necho and replaced by his brother Jehoiakim. These names, you got 11. Jehoiakim reigned for 11 years. Now, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon defeated Egypt and in Judah became a vassal state of Babylon at this time. And Jehoiakim rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, and he died when Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. So in came the next king, Jehoiachin. 
Now, he only ruled three months and ten days. Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin prisoner and his queen and took him off to Babylon and put him in prison. He and his court were carried away into exile. So the last king of Judah was a king by the name of Zedekiah, and he reigned 11 years. He was the third son of Josiah, set on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar as a puppet king. He later joins forces with Egypt, which obviously angered Nebuchadnezzar. And that is when the kingdom of Judah fell to the Babylonians, and they were carried away and exiled. So this is the environment that Jeremiah was trying to preach and prophesy in. And he's often referred to as the weeping prophet. For the most part, his preaching fell on deaf ears. During this time period in Judah's history, they were experiencing the decline of the Assyrian Empire and the rise of the Chaldean or the Babylonian Empire. Now, I want you to understand the wickedness of the day. After King Josiah died, his four sons, one of those being his grandson, were not the leaders he was. Many of the reforms that Josiah had made were quickly abandoned after his death. The people of Judah reverted back to their wicked ways. These Jews had become sensual and materialistic. They had become adulterers. They assembled themselves like the troops in harlot's houses, like well-fed stallions, the Bible says. Everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. You have to love the way these biblical writers express themselves. They assembled themselves like troops in the harlot's houses, Like well-fed stallions, everyone neighed after his neighbor's wife. I keep seeing this horse. I'm (laughs) neighing after his neighbor's wife. (laughs) Great dishonesty, covetousness, dealing falsely with one another. Professing things became all important, all at the expense of their trust. They stole things off their neighbors. Neighbors became treacherous with one another. They worshipped (laughs) idols. People served as many gods as there were streets in Jerusalem. They erected altars to Baal and Moloch and burned their children to them. These were the types of behaviors that the ancient Canaanites did before God gave them the land with honey, you know, the promised land. And and when you read in Leviticus, it says the land vomited them out. The Canaanites were vomited out of that land because of the evil behaviors they had. They clung to their false prophets who proclaimed their wickedness was happiness that they would not be punished for their evil behaviors. This is the environment that Jeremiah was trying to preach in, trying to prophesy in, trying to warn the people of Judah. But it fell on deaf ears. Sure, they said their prayers. They went to temple each week. They put money in the treasury. They went through the motions of serving the God of Israel, but it was simply a routine. It was superficial. They were wicked on the inside. Now, I want to compare that to today. You know, we see this today in our own churches. People come, they do a routine, and then it's back to their worldly lives and their worldly behaviors. God wants a repentant people. He wants a committed people. And that's the title of my message today, becoming a committed servant of God. God wants people who are sold out to the cause. You know, let's remove the entire Jewish nation out of this story, and let's just talk about modern-day examples. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples myself. You know, there's something to be said for people who are committed to something. Is that, has anyone here ever had a, a workmate or a schoolmate who was just committed, committed to the cause? They wanted to do their very best. You, you appreciate, you respect those kind of people, right? I do. I spent 25 years in the Army, and I'm going to talk to you about the three types of soldiers that I learned about during my 25 years of service. You had those that were highly committed. They showed up to work. They were on time. Uniforms looked perfect. Boots were shined. They, they were ready to work as soon as the, the bell rang. It uh, didn't matter what mission you gave them. They could be trusted to go do it. Those were the soldiers you loved. I was a company commander, and I had 100 soldiers underneath me, and, and we had several of those highly committed soldiers that you could trust to get anything done. And then you had those soldiers that just kind of did what was necessary to get by. They weren't bad soldiers, but they weren't going to give 100%. I mean, they were, they were going to show, they, they would make it on time. Their uniform might not look perfectly pressed. They may have not put an extra shine on the boots the night before. You might have to clue them in on what the agenda was for the day. They didn't read the newsletter that you sent out. 
Uh, but they could still be counted on for the most part to do the job and do it right. You just kind of had to coach them a little bit. And I could deal with soldiers like that. But then there was the third kind of soldier. And we referred to them as dirtbags, <laughs> all right? They always late for formation. Boots look like a chocolate candy bar. <laughs> Uniform looked like they just pulled it out of their rucksack and didn't even put an iron to it. You know, they never knew what was going on. You could explain to them what the mission was two or three times. They'd come back and say, now, what was that again? You know, and they didn't take, they didn't take uh, interest in their physical fitness, their appearance. Uh, you know, they, they just, they didn't take interest in being a soldier, representing what a soldier meant to be. And I can remember thinking, why are you even in the Army? Why would you put yourself through this if you're not going to be uh, fully committed? You know, and fast forward 25 years when I took my job at Youngstown State University eight years ago, run the Veterans Center. It was fitting that I run a Veterans Center after spending 25 years in the military. And we've got about 300 veterans at Youngstown State University. And there are those that are highly committed. My son Garrett's one of them. They show up to class. They don't miss their classes. Uh, they get straight A's. They take their, their schooling seriously. They know what they're going to major in. They've, got, they've set that target, and they're shooting for it. And they're going to give it everything they have. I mean, most of these soldiers are getting their school paid for with this GI Bill. So you've got this perfect little gift in front of you. Why not make the most of it, you know? And then you've got those minimum standard people, and it's not always their fault. Some of our veterans are married. They've got kids. They've got jobs. They're trying to balance school and work at the same time. Uh, Garrett's lucky that that's not his situation. You know, he's a single guy. He's, he just goes to school and focuses on school. But we do have some that have other commitments. But, you know, they work hard. They go to school at night. They sit, they're up till midnight studying. They may not make straight A's, but they get A's, B's, maybe a C, occasional C. But, again, I can deal with those kind of students. We can help them. If they need a little tutoring, we can help them. We can get them to the finish line. But then there's that third group of veteran students the ones who wait till the last day to sign up for classes, to sign up for classes. Well, I don't know why you would do that, but prob probably 40 or 50 of our 300 veterans wait until the very, and it, and it gives me fits because I get, I get graded on how many veteran students we have, and I got 40 or 50 that wait till the last day to sign up for classes. And then, and then they don't even go to half the classes. And then you pull a grade report and you see they're failing all their classes. And then you call them, and they're like, well, you know, I wasn't feeling good, or, you know, my car broke down. There's always an excuse why they can't be in class or why they're not making the grade. And I have to think, why in the world would you even go to school? You probably don't even belong in college if you don't have the commitment level to see this through. But, you see, these were the type of people that were living in Jeremiah's day. They liked the idea of being God's people, the nation of Judah, and you would think the fact that their brothers from the north, the nation of Israel, who were taken captive 150 years earlier, would have been enough of a lesson to them to realize they need to get their act together. Or the same thing could happen to them, and it did. But, you, but we had a nation of people that weren't committed to God. They weren't committed to Israel. They weren't committed to the, the one God that had taken care of generations prior to them over and over and over again. They were living a lie. They were showing up the temple. They were throwing money in the treasury. They were saying, praise God, but then they'd go home and offer their children up to Baal and Melah. Uh, it's, it's really sad, the condition that Judah became in the time of Jeremiah. So God wants people that are fully committed, fully sold out. The people of Jeremiah's day were living a lie. They rejected the prophet Jeremiah. They would not repent of their sin. They were not committed to the God of Israel. So how does God react to this people during the days of Jeremiah? Well, if we skip down to Jeremiah 7.20, it says, Therefore saith the Lord God, Behold, mine anger and my fury shall be poured out upon this place, upon man and upon beast and upon the trees of the field and upon the fruit of the ground, and it shall burn and shall not be quenched. Now, is this how you want God to react to our behavior today? We don't want to be a lukewarm church. Church, I, I just want to pray right now. God, don't let us become the lukewarm church that the, 
people of Judah became, Lord God. We want to commit to you fully, Lord God. We want to buy into this with everything, Lord God. Follow you, Lord, with everything we have, God. We don't want that destruction to come upon us, Lord. Lord God, hallelujah, Jesus, have mercy on your people. Let us realize how important it is to put you first in all things, Lord God. Now I want to contrast the behavior of the people of God during Jeremiah's day to what we see on the day of Pentecost 600 years later. If we go to Acts 2 and 1, and I'm going to read a few scriptures here. We're all familiar with this. And it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, heaven as of a ru mighty rushing wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parth Parthians, Medes, the Elamites, and the dwellers in the Mesop Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and in Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, in all the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. So I want to explain the time period here. Jerusalem was no longer the kingdom of Judah, as in Jeremiah's day but now a city, part of a Roman providence. Now, we're all familiar with the story of Jesus. We all well know that Jesus was quickly and unfairly tried, but not convicted and crucified before the Passover festivities. The religious elites, the Pharisees, wanted him disposed of prior to their festival called Passover. Now, this Passover festival commemorated the final plague in Egypt, where the firstborn son of all would be killed. However, God told Moses that the lamb's blood was applied to the threshold of the doors. The angel would pass over them. We're all familiar with that story, right? So after Jesus was laid to rest, we know he rose again on the third day, conquering not only death, but sin and Satan. He proclaimed to his disciples that all power in heaven and earth had been given to him. And he continued with them for 40 days, teaching, mentoring, strengthening those disciples before ascending into heaven. And he tells them before he ascends, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 and 8 says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And ten days later, the Holy Ghost falls as described in Acts 2. Now I want you to think about how remarkable this is. It goes to show just how intentional God is about what he does. Pentecost means 50 days. And it celebrated seven Sabbaths, or 50 days after Passover. So you had Passover, and these, these celebrations would continue for seven weeks, for seven Sabbaths. And after the seventh Sabbath, the 49th day, the next day, was Pentecost, 50 days. Now, what is so amazing about this that I never really considered before is during ancient times, Jews would have traveled from all over the world to celebrate Passover, remain seven weeks until Pentecost. Because every week there was a different feast that they, that they celebrated. The Bible says that 3,000 souls were added to the church that day on the day of Pentecost. But why? Why? 3,000. Remember what I read in Jeremiah. We all know that the kingdom of Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians. And when the Assyrians would conquer somewhere, they would take their best and brightest people and spread them out throughout their, their empire. And they would leave the poor and the sick in and, and there. And then they would bring their people 
the Assyrians would send people from their areas back to that area they conquered, and they would mingle, and it was just, it would almost kind of like take the identity away from the Israelites. And that's why we come up with Samaria. The Jews hated the Samaritans because they were a mixed race. That was from the Assyrians. Uh, the same with Babylon. When they took Judah, they took all those people in Judah, exiled them to Babylonia, to Babylon. Now, some of those folks escaped down to Egypt. Uh, mo most of them went to Babylon. And even when 70 years later, when King Cyrus allowed them to come back and build the temple, a lot of those Jews chose to stay. They had a pretty good life. A lot of them were born in Babylon. That's all they knew. Some of the oldsters, like Ezra, you know, they wanted to come back. But a lot of those young kids that were born in Babylon, trying to convince them to make the however 50-day journey or whatever it was to get back to, to Jerusalem to start building something that was rubble was probably not very easy to do. And a lot of those Jews chose to stay where they were. So I'm trying to paint the picture that Jews were all over the world, the known world at that time. They were in Europe, they were in Rome, they were in Asia, they were down in Egypt, all these countries that I mentioned when I read in Acts. But for this particular celebration, many of these Jews were back. They were back in Jerusalem. They were celebrating the Passover, and they were there for Pentecost. So uh, down through the years, Jews were spread about the ancient world at the hands of various empires, the Assyrian, the Chaldean, the Persian, even the Roman Empire. But at the celebration of Pentecost, you have thousands of Jews from all over the ancient world back in Jerusalem celebrating the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost. Now Jesus spends 40 days with his disciples after raising from the dead. He ascends into heaven and sends the Holy Spirit 10 days later. 50 days. Tell me, wow, tell me God isn't intentional about what he's doing. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, with all those people in Jerusalem from the various parts of the ancient world, the Spirit falls on those in the upper room. They begin to speak with tongues. Jews from other countries hear these Galileans speaking in their native tongue. This is a miracle to them. They can't believe that these people from Galilee are speaking in the tongues that they were born into. Africa, Asia, Pontus, all these countries I mentioned. How remarkable this must have been for them. It was miraculous. Some were amazed, some were in doubt, some mocked. Peter ends up giving a rousing sermon that pricks many of the hearts until they ask Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? <laughs> Acts 2, 38 and 39 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That includes all of us today. Amen. By the thousands, they gladly received the word of the Lord and were baptized. That same day, 3,000 souls were added to the church. And the response, remember the response of God to the people of Judah in Jeremiah's day, the response of the people in Acts 2.42, get this, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now contrast this attitude with the attitude of the Jews during the time of Jeremiah. It's this Acts 2 experience type of commitment that God is looking for in his people. Luke 9 and 6, 2 says, Luke 9 and 62 says, No man, and Jesus said this, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. God wants a people who are committed to the cause. Yeah. You know, two, 2020 changed so many things. And I'm as glad as anyone uh, to be through it. But the problems of 2020 aren't going to go away just because we flipped the calendar over to 2021. We still have a virus out there. We still have social and political unrest. We still have evil forces working in the background to move this country towards a moral and abominable behavior. Many of our small businesses are still shuttered. 
Many churches have moved solely online. In fact, many churches have closed their doors completely. Our schools are online. We do everything so differently now, today. You know, 2020 changed the way we do so many things. And as much as we want to return to pre-2020 times, we have to acknowledge the possibility that we may never see that kind of normal again. But one thing hasn't changed. Jesus is still king of heaven and earth. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. While the world is looking for answers, we just need to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We can be receiving discernment, revelation, understanding, direction from the Almighty God if we can just learn to commit ourselves to Him fully. God is still pouring out that Acts 2 Holy Ghost experience. Why don't we just follow God and let Him worry about the stresses, fears, and complications of this world? My mind takes me to a story that I read just two days ago in my Bible reading. In the book of John, verse 9, Jesus comes across a man who was blinded from birth. His own disciples asked him, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? In ancient Jewish culture, it was believed that any calamity or great suffering was caused by some kind of sin in your life. But Jesus used this man's situation to glorify God. Jesus told them that neither had sinned, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. In church, we live in a fallen world. Good behavior isn't always rewarded, and bad behavior isn't always punished. Innocent people do and will suffer. But regardless of the reasons for our suffering, we have to realize that we serve a God that has the power to help us through that suffering. We serve him for the, if God were to eliminate all suffering, because I've had people say, if God is real, why do people suffer? And it's a good question. But if God were to eliminate all of our suffering, then we would serve him simply for the comfort and convenience of having this non-sufferable life. But God wants us to serve him out of true love and devotion. Regardless, regardless of how hard our life gets, he wants us to serve him out of true love and devotion. Now Jesus heals the blind man by spitting on the ground and rubbing the mud in his eyes, and he tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. And oh boy, what a disturbance this causes among the elites. First, Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees immediately wanted to know who did this and how was it done. So they grab this blind man, this once blind man, and, th and they want him, they demand that he explain how did this happen and, and, and who did this. And he tells them, he tells them, a man named Jesus healed me, healed me, I can see now. The Pharisees didn't want to hear that. So what do they do? They go grab the man's parents. Now this is a grown man. But they went and found his parents. And his parents were like, hey, he's an adult. Uh, ask him how it was done. All we know is he's been blind all his life, and now he sees. So they question, the Pharisees questioned the blind man again. Tell us how this happened. The blind man who once could not see gets into a theological debate with the Pharisees. <laughs> he says, how could a man, how could someone possibly heal a blind man from birth if he were not of God? because they were trying to say Jesus was not of God. Even this unlearned blind man all his life knew this had to be a man of God. The Pharisees take issue with the unlearned once blind man trying to school them and on how they should believe, and they toss him out of the, the synagogue. Jesus hears about this, and he goes and finds the blind man, and he says, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? In John 9, 36 through 38, I want to read this to you. The, blind, the once blind man answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Now when he said, Thou hast both seen me, both, I was a little confused by that. There was, who was the other person he was talking about? And when I studied about that, it said, what Jesus was saying is, you felt and experienced me while you was blind, but now you see me. So in both of your conditions, you know who the, who the Lord is. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord God. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. This is the response we should have for God today. Lord, I believe, and I worship you. Hallelujah. Folks, I don't want to be 
a people like the people in Jeremiah's day who pretended to serve God but were actually worshiping their own flesh and desires, God brought great wrath and destruction upon those people. I want to be like the 3,000 who received the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost and who continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I want to be like the blind man from birth who when he had his experience with Jesus said he believed and he worshiped. I want to be com a committed servant of God who doesn't ask why is this happening to me but says, God, give me the strength to overcome. The Acts 2 experience on the day of Pentecost is still available to us today in 2021. So that's the end of my message. But I want us all to come forward. I want us all to pray. We have time here this morning. It's not even 1 o'clock yet. Let's, let's put some, some, all right, we got some singers. Awesome. Some singers and I just want to reiterate the Acts 238 experience is still available.